welcome to the, the first meeting of the Haddon Arts and Sciences Forum. The, the, I suppose the, the reformed forum or the, the, the change forum. Anyway, I'm Kieran Quinlan. I come from the English department and I've been the director of the Haddon Forum uh, for about the last Irish. 10 years. Uh, I'm an Irishman, yes. Irish <laughs> but um, I've been the director for that length of time. The, the, the forum itself was um, founded almost 40 years ago and it's named after uh, Dr. Ted Haddon, who's a retired faculty member of the English department. And over the four decades, it has, even though it has been based in the in the what was the School of Arts and Humanities, it has changed and morphed according to um, the faculty and their interests. And of course, the biggest change is coming about right now. And we have nine speakers, I should say, bravely recruited by uh, Associate Dean uh, Rebecca Bach, um, and I emphasize bravely recruited. We have talks on a huge diversity of uh, subjects, um, all the way from um, electronic materials uh, to health disparities, Thomas Jefferson, um, even Satan. So there are, there's a great diversity. And, and because of the great diversity, there's a pressure on all of us um, to stretch ourselves. Uh, when I look over um, Dr. David Hilton's resume for today's talk, uh, I recognize some words. I <laughs> vaguely remember X-ray diffraction, electron gas, I, at least I know electron and I know gas, and I'm a little bit vague on electron gas uh, put together. I know kind of what a cyclotron is, but we also, I, I realize that we, we are, as well as being learned people, we belong to learning communities, and we all have to stretch ourselves. And in, in the actual world outside, as we all know, we have to go way beyond our own particular disciplines just to engage with day-to-day uh, -day life. Um, so I, I think for both the presenters and the audiences, there will be new efforts will be needed to, to um, engage in dialogue. Um, Dr. David Hilton has his PhD from Cornell. Uh, he has spent time in Los Alamos and he is, uh, has appointments in the departments of physics and electrical engineering. Um, I better not go any further than that because I'll make a fool of myself. Um, what, what I will say, the, the format that we have is that, that he will speak for loosely, and so just uh, emphasize loosely, for about a half an hour and then we will open the floor to discussion. And uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for the introduction. I'm struck by your introduction at, the, at how much what we do comes down to language and, and all of these words. And, and one of the things that we do in physics often is, is create our own words to describe things. And that oftentimes puts up a barrier. Um, but what I want to talk today about is a little bit of the research program that I put together here at UAB, and I'm specifically interested in, in materials physics and a specific interest in materials that are used for everyday electronics. So I imagine every single person in this room owns multiple computer processors through laptops, cell phones, and all of these things. These kinds of devices have basically taken uh, and, and completely reshaped our lives. And so I want to talk a little bit about what materials are currently being used but then the work that we do basically says, I want to look for new, new kinds of materials, new kinds of functionality, or I want to take existing materials and trick them to do new kinds of things. And so this is a brief outline, and this is brief, unfortunately. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about electronic materials, what kinds of things people are currently using, and what kinds of things people are, are interested in using. I want to talk about some of the tools. Um, there's that old adage about boys and their toys. Um, I have some pretty nice toys that we work with either here at UAB 
or with some of our collaborators. And then I want to talk about kind of two experiments that we take a look at. There's one material that we're interested in. It's called vanadium dioxide. It shows a particular phenomenon called an insulator to metal phase transition. I'll talk a little bit about what that is. And then some of the work that we're doing in collaboration with Dr. Vora's group to take a look at this particular material under high pressure. Um, the two-dimensional electron gas that you were talking about. Um, this is basically trying to take a, a fairly old material called gallium arsenide and get it to do new things. And so there's going to be a little bit of quantum mechanics in all of this and the kinds of new things that we can do when we start to talk about very, very small materials. And then I want to talk a little bit about you know, the future direction for my research program, where we're going from, from all of this. Um, so in terms of current materials, most of you own, so this is a periodic table, most of you own multiple computer processors. And without fail, basically every single one of them is based on silicon. Um, Intel, IBM, Texas Instruments, all of these kinds of companies have spent billions of dollars to try and figure out how to grow material, how to grow electronic integrated circuits on silicon. And they have this down to exquisite levels of control. So uh, you, you cannot possibly beat the economics of building circuits out of any other kind of material. Everything is going to be done in silicon if it can be done in silicon. But beyond silicon, there are some other materials that we use. Uh, popular one, gallium arsenide. It's one that I look at frequently. And right now, you're looking at a laser pointer. It's a gallium arsenide laser. So this is very commonly used in optics. Um, gallium nitride. How many people own Blu-ray uh, players? So that's a gallium nitride laser. It's actually the, the pickup laser and something like that. So there's some commercial applications for gallium nitride and a few other this, ones with these materials. Um, it's possible to add in materials like indium and aluminum into this kind of uh, optoelectronics type uh, materials and everything like that. Carbon, uh, this is thought to be kind of the next generation. If any material is going to replace silicon, and I'll talk about this a little bit later in the talk, it's probably going to be something based on carbon. Um, there was actually a Nobel Prize about two years ago for people who were starting to push a future of carbon electronics. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So in terms of electronic materials, Basically, everything you own in terms of the periodic table, I throw copper in here because they use copper for wiring for a lot of things, um, just like you do in your home. But basically, most all of the materials that you own in terms of computer processors, your cell phone, these kind of things, are just a very small subset of elements from the periodic table. Uh, so in terms of circuitry trip, uh, circuit chips and things like this, uh, Moore's Law is, is an observation that comes from 1965. Gordon Moore founded Intel. And he took a look in 1965 at what was happening with integrated circuits, and the complexity of them kept growing exponentially. So he set up this kind of empirical rule that's largely held. So a transistor is the basic little circuit element in any of these computer chips that largely functions like a switch. So it's either on or off. Um, and he was looking at the future, as he saw it in 1965, and about every two years, the number of transistors on one of these chips was doubling. And so he made this prediction, and if you read this paper, he predicts out as far as 1975, and he, he doesn't go any further than that, although it has continued since 1975. I found this somewhat ironic because I was born in 1975. So you know, this was his idea of the future at the time, not entirely my idea of the future. But uh, if you look at the number of transistors, Intel, and so this comes off of Intel's website, the, their first, what we consider to be a computer processor, was the 4004. That was released in 1971. It had about 2,300 transistors. Um, this computer bought last year. It's got a core i7 processor on it. It's got 2.3 billion transistors. So they've learned how to take this process. This goes up by a factor of 10 and do this extremely efficiently. Uh, the way that they do this is they make everything smaller. So this is the minimum size of features on various processors. So if everybody knows what a millimeter is, this is a hundredth of a millimeter. So we're talking very small to begin with. And it's gone down, and so again, this is by factors of 10. Uh, this processor in this laptop that you're watching this presentation, the minimum feature size is 35 nanometers. Actually, if you were to go out and buy one right now, it's 28 nanometers. But everything keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. There is, however, a problem coming. So if you take these numbers and you look at silicon, the material, you take the atom spacing for silicon in this particular material, and instead of talking about microns, you talk about the number of atoms of silicon. So we take this 35 nanometers, we basically are getting down to hundreds of atoms for these kinds of things. So we're getting down to structures that are not going to be made a thousand times smaller unless we figure out how to split atoms. <laughs> so we're, we're running into basic fundamental limits. If we want to continue to increase the number of transistors, we're starting to run into very, very fundamental limits. So Moore's Law, it's reaching this kind of fundamental limit. And honestly, over the last 40 years, 
there have been lots of fundamental limits that Moore's Law was never going to get passed, and it got passed every single one of them. Um, so saying if this is the end of Moore's Law, it's probably good to go to one of my favorite authors, Mark Twain, um, and a very famous quote of his. You know, so uh, if, if you know the story behind all of this, his cousin was very ill, and so he grew up actually, and he, he was a, uh, based in Elmira, New York, where I was born. Um, and his cousin was very ill, and the New York Times heard, but they mixed up and they thought he was dead, and so they sent this letter, and this was his response uh, to all of this, that, that this was something of an exaggeration. So, Moore's Law is going to be running into problems, but it's run into many problems before. But this is the motivation behind, we want to look for new materials, silicon may, be, may not be the best choice going forward. Uh, however, if people can figure out how to build it out of silicon, they'll figure out how to build it out of silicon. And that's purely an economic argument. It, it always has been. People have to make one transistor. They have to then make 2.3 billion transistors and a chip. And then they have to make millions of chips. So it's always been an economic argument. It's always been easier to do with silicon. I could talk for a long time about gallium arsenide, why it's a better electronic material. Its electronic properties are better. If I did transistors in silicon and transistors in gallium arsenide, the gallium arsenide ones would be faster. I could talk for a long time about why you should be doing it in gallium arsenide. It's an economic argument, everybody does it in silicon. Gordon Moore has a famous quote about gallium arsenide, founder of Intel. He says that gallium arsenide is the material of the future, and it always will be. There's always <laughs> reasons why you should do things in different materials, and it's not a physics issue why it's not being done in that. It's purely, they need to make millions of these. So, if we want to look for new materials, the way that we look at it is, I want to find those things that I can do that I couldn't possibly do in, in, in something like silicon. Because if I could do it in silicon, Intel's going to kill me. If I can't do it in silicon, then maybe I, have a cap maybe I have a possibility. So what else is possible? As I said, primarily we look at these kinds of elements for all of these electronics. But there's a whole periodic table with lots of other material, with lots of other elements and lots of other compounds that are possible. So you've got a few problems with this. This last row here, if you know anything about the periodic table, those atoms have lifetimes of milliseconds or less. So those don't really last particularly long. So that's not really an option. Uh, this column over here, uh, these are all basically gases, helium, neon, all of these things. They don't bond with anything else, period. They're gases, so they're not really a possibility. Uh, but there's lots of other uh, atoms that we can look at. So if you look down here, these are in, in the orange, these are all of your nuclear elements. So yeah, we might be able to build stuff out of them, but they're likely going to kill you in the process. So that they're probably not a great choice for doing stuff like this. Um, new functionality. So silicon is always going to be the choice for things unless we can find some reason, some other phenomena, some other way to do it. Because the economics are never going to support anything else. Uh, so what we do is, is we try and look for these kinds of novel phenomena different combinations of atom, different materials that exhibit different phenomena that's not possible in silicon. Or uh, we take a look at gallium arsenide and we're trying to get gallium arsenide to do tricks that it doesn't really necessarily do otherwise. And so we have some uh, structures that do stuff like that. So in terms of phenomena, novel phenomena in some of these uh, more complex materials, there's a phenomenon called colossal magnetic resistance. I got a slide on that in a second. Interest there is in data storage, the hard drive on that computer. Uh, superconductivity, this is an area that Dr. Vora works in. Uh, this is all coming down to energy efficiency for electronics, or if you've ever had an MRI, you've, you've, you've been in the middle of a superconducting magnet when you did this. Uh, and then what our interest is in terms of these more exotic phenomena is vanadium dioxide, and this shows an insulator to metal phase transition. So at room temperature, it's as transparent as that glass. You heat it up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, turns into a metal. So, you know, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. I think we had that in, in July, didn't we? <laughs> Around here. So, um, so you might have something like that where you could coat that window, and this is actually what is called photochromism. And I have a friend of mine who's trying to set up a startup company, but you could coat that window. So, it, at this type of a temperature, it's perfectly transparent. But if the sunlight beats down it and starts to heat the window up, then the window is going to turn opaque and it's going to keep the house from heating up. So you might be able to consider something like this. Instead of tinting the window, you could have some kind of coating on a material, on a window like this, to try and cut down on your, your cooling costs in the summer. And, and God knows every single person in this room would probably appreciate that, given Alabama's temperature. Um, optical communications work that I did, I'll show you the, the data from all of this. When I was at Los Alamos, demonstrated how we can actually use lasers to trigger this phase transition versus just heating things. And so that's another possibility for all of this. Colossal magnetoresistance, if you go to a periodic table, 
This is a phenomenon material, so this is the manganese atom. So if you take one manganese, three oxygens, and you alloy it with, uh, so I'm going to show you data that's presidium, calcium, manganese, oxide, uh, PCMO. We, we do lots of acronyms when we start doing some of these, these particular compounds. But this shows very large changes in resistance depending on whether there's a magnetic field on something. So this is a magnetic field sensor. Um, so these are some data. Uh, actually, I actually have a good friend of mine down at the National High Magnetic Field Lab. We'll talk a little bit about Steve in a second. These are actually from his PhD thesis. And so what I have plotted here is the resistance of this material. And then what, I have pl what we've got plotted here on the, the axis here is magnetic field. So three Tesla, if you've ever had an MRI, that's generally the scale of a magnetic field for an MRI. So I'm gonna make you clear the, the, the metal out of your pockets and everything like that. But a couple of Tesla will give you this kind of a resistance change. And so if you turn on the magnetic field, then you see the resistance of this material go up. If you shut the magnetic field back off, it goes back down. Uh, the idea here um, in terms of applications is that hard drive. So the hard drive consists of a magnetic material, and you write information on it by flipping the north and the south pole. So there's individual bits here, there's eight of them here, and so the south pole is a zero, the north pole is a one. If you have one of these magnetoresistive materials, then you basically you read the current off of one of them as you go over this particular structure, and you read the data that's on, on the, the disk platform. So the way that I have this written out in binary, it's actually the letter H. And so if you want to increase data storage, then we need to pack these closer together. That's actually going to make this current smaller. So one of the possible applications for materials like this is to allow us to push hard disk capacities up higher and higher and higher because we have to pack more and more information in them. Um, for superconductivity, i am actually got a couple of papers of Dr. Vora's referenced here. Um, one of the classes of materials that people look at takes iron with arsenic, and these are called the nictides. And then this is alloyed with a couple of materials like strontium, calcium, Actually, europium should be popping up. Uh, this is actually uh, the compound that Walter Ahoya, one of our graduate students, is looking at for his PhD thesis. But if we take these kinds of materials, these are what we call superconductors. They don't have any resistance whatsoever. Um, and people are very interested in figuring out how to get materials that will, have, that will exhibit this kind of superconductivity at higher and higher temperatures. Right now, these materials turn superconducting something like 300 degrees below zero. So they're not very practically applicable. If you look at the, the electrical grid in the United States, if you look at the power that's generated at power plants, lots of that energy gets lost to the resistance in the wires before it ever gets to your house. So if we could devise what are called room temperature superconductors, which don't exist, but there's lots of people looking to try and find these, then we might be able to increase the energy efficiency of the electrical grid as a result. Given the number of uh, problems our society has in terms of energy and whether you say we go to war over energy or not, it depends on your politics, but we have lots of issues in terms of energy and that's not gonna get any better in the future. What we look at, and I wanna just introduce the material right now, is what's called an insulator to metal phase transition. So this is something that at room temperature doesn't conduct electricity. If you heat the sample up, it all of a sudden becomes a metal and starts to conduct electricity. Uh, the material that we look at is, uh, uses vanadium and two oxygens, vanadium dioxide. And it's a material that people have been looking at for a long time. So this was a, a paper that was published in 1971. The material was first developed in 1961. People have known about this insulator metal phase transition since then. Nobody has really any microscopic idea why it happens. There is not a good theory for figuring out why this particular material does this. Uh, lots of people have been looking at all of this. You could. I consider this one of the classic cases in condensed matter physics. Some people who don't like my proposals on it refer to it as, as the condensed matter equivalent of Don Quixote's windmill. Everybody has to chase after it at some point, but nobody's ever gonna catch it. Um, in terms of experimental techniques, the toys that we use, um, although they're rather expensive to be calling toys, uh, the, the, the basic technique that we use is, is, is something called ultra-fast spectroscopy. In 1991, there was a new type of laser that came on the market called a titanium sapphire laser. Uh, what these lasers are, are is, is uh, tremendously powerful lasers, although if you looked at them, you wouldn't necessarily think so because they're right on the edge of what you can see. Uh, what you get out of one of these lasers is short pulses. So unlike this laser where the light is on all of the time, this only spits out little bits of energy uh, in, very short, in very short doses. So uh, you get 8 million pulses per second out of one of these, and then each of these pulses is basically 50 femtoseconds. So many people have heard of femto. 
as a, as a unit before. A couple people. So a femtosecond is a quadrillionth of a second. So give you a scale of all of this, in one second there is 10 to the 15th power femtoseconds. If I instead ask the question, how long is 10 to the 15th power seconds? That's 23 million years. So if you went that far back in time, there are still dinosaurs walking around where we are right now. So we're talking extremely fast time scales in, sort of, in these sorts of materials. The technique is somewhat similar to time-lapse photography. So in time-lapse photography, you take an individual snapshot of how something is falling or something like that, and then you reconstruct it from all of those images. Well, that's the same thing that we do with this, only we're using these short pulses to sample what the material looks like at these various pieces of time so that we can reconstruct this. We do this because there's no detector that can pick up anything this fast. And so we have to use these techniques that are a little bit more like stop-motion photography to be able to do all of this. Uh, so this is actually a, a diagram of an experiment that's over in my lab over in Campbell Hall. Uh, another technique that we use that also uses titanium uh, sapphire lasers is what we call terahertz spectroscopy. So this is my graduate student, Bhagwan Sangala's experiment over in Campbell Hall. When we talk about terahertz, we're talking about the part of, of, of the electromagnetic spectrum that's between light and between microwaves. So you're looking right now at wavelengths that are somewhere on the order of about a micron. Um, the, the wireless internet and everything like that are looking at uh, wavelengths that are on the order of about a, a centimeter or longer than that. And so this is actually a region of the spectrum that's somewhere in between both of these. Um, it, it, it is a region of the spectrum that for many years there were no sources for. That's no longer the case. We do have those kinds of capabilities. Um, but, but this allows us to look at properties of materials that we want to look at. This allows us to study the dynamics of materials in, in ways that we were never able to do before. Uh, other capabilities that we use um, picture is a little dark for this, I apologize for that. Um, we use some unique capabilities that are associated with uh, the National High Magnetic Field Lab. So this is the facility that we all pay for as taxpayers. This is funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, there are three facilities. There's one at Florida State, there's one in Gainesville, and there's one at Los Alamos. This is actually a picture of a magnet that's uh, 45 Tesla. So your refrigerator magnet's a fraction of a Tesla. If you've ever had an MRI, it's a couple of Tesla. This is something that you don't want to get anywhere near. Um, oh yeah, and this is actually the platform on top of it. You're standing on top of it when you're running experiments. It is safe up there, but the magnet is actually here. This is about two stories high. Um, this, is, this was commissioned in 1994, and this is a resource that's available to any researcher who wants to use it. You can pay their travel down there and can justify the science that they want to do. A uh, Couple of neat things about this. I actually know the director of the lab. Um, to run one of these takes an enormous amount of, uh, of electricity. In fact, when this is running, and this is not an exaggeration, this facility is 10% of the electricity being used in the city of Tallahassee when this is being run. At one point, I had a meeting with the director of the lab, and I just jokingly asked him how much his electric bill was that month. He asked me how much my house was worth. <laughs> And that's actually, Florida put an enormous amount of money to lure this facility there, so that's probably a subsidized rate where the state's paying a lot of that as well. So this is, this is the kind of a scope of facility that only a government can put together. Uh, a university needs this kind of support to do all of this. The neat thing about it is, is that this is a capability that is largely unavailable anywhere else, and it's a five hour drive from here. So this is something that's actually fairly easy for us to do it, uh, not easy, but it's easier for us to get there in comparison to other researchers. And so these are kind of capabilities that we can, we can build off of. Uh, we also use some facilities from the Center for Integrated Nanotechnology. Uh, this is the, the, the group that I worked at when I was at Los Alamos National Labs. Um, and these, this is funded by the Department of Energy. And so they've got a, a, a broad range of capabilities. I have one femtosecond laser. The woman that I used to work for, I'm not joking, has 20. So there's a, there's a capability here and there's, there's a broad broad capability that's not something that we can easily build on this campus. But these are all things that are available to my graduate students. And so these are some data that my graduate student, Nate Brady, took the last time he was out at SIT. Um, the other thing we do, um, this is in collaboration with Dr. Vora's group, is we use the advanced photon source and we use x-ray diffraction measurements. And so our interest with all of this, and this is another funded by the Department of Energy user facility, and our interest is to try and understand what the structure of these materials are, what's the arrangement of the atoms, and how does that affect these electronic behavior. Um, in terms of materials that we look at, there's this vanadium dioxide, and the interest here is this metal to insulator phase transition. So this is the arrangement of atoms, and I, I haven't drawn the oxygen on here, but you want to think about this as a basic unit. So think of a shoebox, and I've got vanadium atoms on each of the corner, 
And then the key feature for all of this is that we've got these extra atoms that are basically paired off and, and tilted from all of this. This is what vanadium dioxide, if you were to measure its crystal structure, this is what it looks like when it's an insulator. When it goes through this phase transition, let me skip some of this here. When it goes through this phase transition and when it goes into its metallic phase, these atoms shift up and you've got this as your basic unit. So the, the, the size of the shoebox has gotten smaller and you've got this very slight change in this vanadium atom position and this material goes from being an insulator and the conductivity can rise by a factor of 10,000 just from this very small change in the atomic position. This is why this is so fascinating to somebody who does what I do is, is a very tiny change has these catastrophic consequences. As I said, people have been looking at this now for 50 years. They still don't understand why this small change in crystal structure leads to this fantastic change in the conductivity. And that's what we can do. So these are some data that we took a look at from a sample. This is actually back from when I was at Los Alamos. But we're looking, what's plotted here is the conductivity of the material. What's plotted here is temperature. So this is room temperature. This is about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is getting closer to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you take this sample and you just simply heat it up, conductivity, its ability to conduct electricity is basically zero. Start to turn it up and basically the conductivity goes up by a factor of a thousand. And so understanding all of this is, is the open question with these particular materials. What we did when I was at Los Alamos in addition to all of this is instead of putting this on a, a heating pad and turning the temperature up, we actually used one of these short pulse lasers. And so we used the pulse laser to put energy into the system. That's what comes here at T equals zero. And we showed that you can use these lasers to drive this transition as well. So a picosecond is 1,000 femtoseconds. So that's slow to me, but that's still incredibly fast otherwise. So what came out of all of this is this can be driven as an optical transition, and there's, there's potential applications for stuff like this in terms of optical communications where we want to be able to flip signals on and off quickly, this could be a material used to modulate all of that. We also took a look at how much of this laser energy is necessary to drive this transition, what we call a threshold fluence, and we were able to, to take a look at this as a function of temperature and figure out of this laser pulse how much energy is necessary to drive this in the first place. So these are all the kind of capabilities that you can get with these kind of TICEF uh, lasers and kind of things that we can take a look at. Uh, the work that we're doing here is in collaboration with Dr. Vora's group, and we're trying to understand the crystal structure of this. So if you're familiar with what Dr. Vora does, it's, it's basically high pressure, so you take some poor material, you stick it between two diamonds, and you put it under an enormous amount of pressure. What that pressure does is basically take all of this lattice structure and make it smaller. And so it forces these atoms more close together, and it starts to modify the electronics of all of this. And so these are some recent data that my graduate student, Nate Brady, has taken, but we've got here a B and C, those are the three sides of this um, shoebox that we're looking at here. This beta angle here is the angle of these vanadium dimers, and we're able to use facilities like the, the, the advanced photon source to take a look at these materials and to understand what their structure is. And then we're going to be using, hopefully next week, hopefully, <laughs> some of Dr. Vora's capability to take a look at the electronic structure as well of all of these, um, so that we can understand what's the influence that the order of the atoms has on the electronic behavior. So the other experiment I want to talk a little bit about is this idea of taking old materials and getting them to do new tricks. So this idea is called quantum coherence. And so if, how many football fans do I have? A few? So if, if you watch the Alabama-Michigan game this weekend, um, these, these games are governed by the rules. There's only like two or three football fans in here. I don't think that's allowed in Alabama. There was like two or three hands up. I don't think that's actually allowed in this state, is it? So, uh, but if you look at all of this, these are the rules of how you know, football moves and stuff like that. These are Isaac Newton's rules, largely. And so these are very well understood. They don't apply to electrons. Um, if you woke up tomorrow morning, uh, make a Kafka reference, if you woke up tomorrow morning not as a cockroach but as an electron, the rules have completely changed for you. Uh, you're no longer talking about a ball like this. So if I throw up this ball, then you can at any point tell me where the ball is and how fast it's going. Quantum mechanics doesn't work that way. Quantum mechanics says I have you know, a couple of places that I can put this ball. In classical mechanics, I can put this ball in one location and it will stay there. In quantum mechanics, I can actually put the ball in both of those locations at the same time. And I can do these very weird things. This all seems intuitively wrong, but that's because our intuition is wrong. 
we don't live by the rules of quantum mechanics, we live by the rules of football, hopefully not getting crushed by some of those, the, those guys who are the defensive backs, but we don't live by these rules. What, what is interesting is the fact that we can start to do new things with these kinds of materials. So for this work, um, this is a, the spectrometer that we have. Actually, it's down at the National High Magnetic Field Lab. Uh, Jeremy Curtis is my graduate student. Uh, this is Luke McClintock, who is also known as the McClintock who doesn't do biology. Um, <laughs> Luke was my student uh, this summer and is continuing to work in my lab this fall to build this. This is a prototype of an experiment that we're building up here over in Campbell Hall, and then we'll drive it down to Tallahassee. Uh, this is actually the experiment that we have down in Tallahassee that we built with my startup package. Uh, so this is a 10 Tesla magnetic field to give you a scale of that. That's about my height. So this is a smaller magnet for the magnet lab, but it's still a, a massive one. Uh, but this can get us to about 10 Tesla. And so we can do these kinds of experiments in this. And, and the goal is to take a look at a structure like this. So this is grown um, from our collaborators at the Center for Integrated Nan Nanotechnology. And they have exquisite control over growing these kinds of semiconductors. And I don't have a clue how they do this. Uh, they're very good at what they do with this. They send me fantastic samples, and I get out of their way. Uh, but we're looking at here a structure that's several hundred layers. The only one that I'm actually interested in is this one. This entire structure is built to mimic a layer in a transistor. So the actual conducting layer in a transistor is very similar to this gallium arsenide layer. I just don't have to worry about the rest of the electronics to get this working. That's why the structure is made like this. It makes the experiments easier. But this entire two-dimensional layer here, so carriers are free to move in this direction in this layer, but they're actually not allowed to move up or down. And they're also allowed to move in and out of the board. So the conductivity allows them to move around in a sheet, but it actually doesn't allow them to move up and down. The structure is designed this way, and this is what the channel inside of a transistor looks <coughs> like. We just have to worry about all of the electronics that go along with transistors. So if we put an external magnetic field on, then we can start to do very weird things. The goal here with this structure is to predict what we're going to get at with transistors 10 years down the road. If we continue to make things smaller and smaller and smaller, those weird rules of quantum mechanics are going to take over. My transistor, if I look at the way circuits are designed, my transistors are on, that's a binary one, or they're off, that's a binary zero. If we start to push these things down to smaller and smaller and smaller distances, it's going to become very difficult for us to say either. It's going to be in some kind of weird quantum mechanical state we're starting to have these kind of coherent effects where things are going to be kind of on, kind of off, somewhere in between. All of these kind of strange things that happen in quantum mechanics if we continue to push. This structure is designed to help us figure out what's going on in these um, today versus having to wait until Intel can figure out how to do this <coughs> later on. So we use this magnetic field and we create these two states. So this is off and this is on. And so these are some data that we took a couple years ago. It's been published this past year in a conference proceeding. We have a bigger paper on all of this. Uh, but we have this, and so this is similar to you know, this, this ball. So we have two potential states available. If I take this electron and I put it, I, I can't ever put it in one of these states. What I can do with my laser pulse is put it in one of these superposition states. So at any point when I'm taking these data, if I try to figure out which state this is in, it could be in either of them. It's in a superposition of both of them. It's kind of like me saying you're sitting in both the chair you're sitting in and the one next to you at the same time. As I said, this is not intuitive, but it's correct for electrons. So we come through with one of our terahertz sources. We put it in one of these coherent superposition states, and we set this process off oscillating. The interesting thing that we found from our data, and you can see I clearly blocked some of it off, when we come through with another one of these pulses, we can start this whole process again. And, and the interesting thing for us is now we want to look at, if, if, if you're Intel, these kind of coherent processes are a problem. They're going to cause you to stop being able to make transistors eventually. Instead, what we're looking at them is, is, is a good idea. Uh, we can put things in these kind of coherent states, and we can start to manipulate things. And so this would be a ground up change the way that electronics are done, because it will no longer be done with transistors, it would be done with light and magnetic fields and these kinds of things. Work that we have done in collaboration with Rice University, so Takashi Arikawa was a postdoc uh, that actually replaced me. I spent some time at Rice University before I came here. So we have one terahertz pulse that sets off this oscillation, and depending on when we time this second pulse, we can either shut it back off or we can enhance it again. So we can come through with a terahertz pulse, start this coherent superposition, turn it off, turn it back on, 
we're hoping to be able to flip it upside down. That's what's called a logic not gate, all of these kinds of things. But the, the idea here is, is, is that the material is structured such that we should be able to sit down, put it in one of these coherent states, start playing around with it, start being able to do quantum operations, start being able to do processing, and hopefully build this into a completely different way of doing electronics for future work for all of this. Um, graphene is a material, this is when I was talking about the possibility of carbon electronics. Graphene is a material that lots of people look at. Um, if you take carbon, so most of you are familiar with carbon in its form diamond. Um, the, other the other place that you're familiar with, with carbon would be in graphite, so that's gonna be a mechanical pencil or some kind of pencil. Those are the two types of carbon that you look at. Graphene is just a single layer of carbon atoms. It's on basically what is sometimes referred to as chicken wire. Lattice, it's just carbon atoms sitting on individual corners of chicken wire. This is ultimately the ultimate two-dimensional material. I was talking about gallium arsenide and John Reno spent years trying to figure out how to grow that particular structure. This is by default the two-dimensional layer. Two years ago, these two gentlemen won a Nobel Prize for being able to synthesize graphene. This is an area that I'm very interested in, but there's a few problems with all of this. I'm actually gonna replicate their experiment for making graphene. So what they did is they started off with a mechanical pencil, got some of it on a piece of paper, used a peach of scotch tape, pulled some of the graphene off, and sat there with a Raman microscope and tried to find a little tiny flake in there that's single layer graphene versus graphite. This is the state of the art for manufacturing graphene today. <laughs> Lots of people are spending money trying to figure out how to do it a little bit better than that. But if you're Intel, you laugh at this. Because it's not enough to find one piece of graphene, you've got to find 2.3 billion of them for each chip. So there's lots of people, Dr. Kamada over in physics uh, takes a look at building new materials. This is not one of them that he looks at, but there's lots of people that are trying to figure out how to grow graphene. This is something that we're very